Uh, last week we talked about you become like that which you behold. And the question was, is what are you beholding? If you don't know what you're beholding, just look at how life is going. Look at uh, your, what you're doing, how you talk to your spouse. Look at how you treat others. And that should tell you right there, because uh, your mouth is the mirror of your heart. And we've talked about exalting the Lord. We sang the song last week, I Exalt Thee. Do you remember that? And I said, I challenge you men and women, but I'm aiming at the men because I is one. Exalt the Lord in your home. I, I, I love to worship, but I had to get over myself. And, and I have to discipline myself. It doesn't mean I always want to do it. But the Bible never said, do you want to do that? You know, sometimes when I sing out to the Lord, it sounds like a cat's getting run over by a lawnmower. And I'm okay with that because I'm getting moved emotionally. I'm not that horrible of a singer. But when, when I get emotional, I don't know about you, but you're like, when Christ is choker. <laughs> you know, you're moved emotionally. If the Holy Spirit's moving you, it's okay. Now, if you're just being emotional, that's another. But when the Holy Spirit's moving you, it's about the heart of worship. That's what it's all about. And God says he'll reveal his promises to you and to me. And we find that in his word. So have you ever heard the saying, promises, promises? All I ever get is what? Promises. Why do we come up with that? Because so many people have made promises to us that they've broke. And when they broke it, we've learned this pattern and we've learned this routine that when somebody says, I promise, you can almost guarantee it's probably not going to come true. You know, some people you know that you can count on. Some people you, you don't, you, you know, you can't. Some of them just depends on the day or what what's going on in their life. And then you, all of a sudden you just start to feel people in general. It's kind of, low grade, kind of like a low-grade fever where you just feel like, I just can't trust people. And somehow we translate that to God when we talk about the promises of God. And we think that though we know there's promises, sometimes we don't believe that God will come through in those promises. Did you know that there's over 7,000 promises in the Bible? Do you have your Bible with you? Hold it up. Let me see it. There we go. 7,000 stinking promises in this thing for you and for me. Can you believe it? If you've got something going on in your life and you're saying, nobody has ever gone through this before, oh, contraire, mon frere. I bet there's something in here where you can find a promise that God has to speak to you because God took all of our burdens, all of our worries, all of our fears. He took upon every form of sin and was nailed to the cross so that way he could have the victory and then hand it to you and me. And that's a promise that he gives. But though there's 7,000 promises in the Bible, it doesn't mean that, um, it doesn't mean that life is going to be a bed of roses, right? Anyone here that your life is like a rose garden? Didn't they have a song, I beg your pardon, I never promised you a rose garden? I don't, that's that old music I know my mom played when I, I remember all kinds of music and appreciate it pretty much, but heck, we write songs about promises that can never come to fruition. We grow up thinking that even God himself may not fulfill his promise. And, and so we don't perceive or we don't pursue or go after what God has for us. But we have to know there are over 7,000 promises in here. And what you and I need to do, number one, you can write this down in your outline, is know this. Each person is filled with God's promises. Yeah. Write that in. You have to start there. We have to have a starting point, and the starting point is that each person is filled with God's promises. If you're here today and you're breathing, you are filled with God's promises. If you are here today and you are not breathing, you've just now experienced God's promises, okay? Uh, hopefully. God has a promise for you. You may be going through a miserable situation. Guess what? God is still on the throne. But you don't understand, I got evicted from my house. God's still on the throne. My car broke down. He's still on the throne. You don't understand, the law showed up in my house and I got problems. God's still on the throne. The question is not, is he on the throne? It's do you know his promises for your life? See, there's a key that needs to, to be addressed before we can unlock these promises. And I'm going to try to give it to you in 25 minutes, okay? Look with me at 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. I'm going to just read verses 1 through 4. Peter writes, uh, his, his uh, well, let's see here, the first chapter he really talks about spiritual growth, growing spiritually, maturing in our walk with Christ. Chapter 2, you find out that he's dealing with false doctrine and teachers. Uh, chapter 3 is more of a prophetic chapter, return, uh, talking about the return of Christ. 
So he says in chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours, by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has, he has granted to us his precious and magnificent what? Promises. So that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. How do you escape the corruption of the world and become a partaker with Jesus Christ? You receive his promises. If I were going to give you a gift today, and I said, this morning, Mabel, I want to give you a gift. And if I extend it like this, how is Mabel going to receive that gift? Reach out and grab it. That's how she's going to grab the gift. That's how she's going to get the gift. God says, I've got a promise for you. Give me my pencil back. And let's say I go over here and I say, Yuli, i got the promises of God for you. Good job. Good job. Now give me it back. I'll say, I go over here and I'll pick on my dad. Dad, grab the promises. Let's say it. Don't, don't grab it. Don't grab it. Don't Give me that back. No. <laughs> you read your Bible too much. There we go. Let's say that I give him the promise, I extend it, but he does not reach out for it. Does he get the pencil? When God extends the promise, if we don't do our part to reach out and take that promise, receive it is what it is, then we wonder why God, God doesn't love me. I know he's a good, good father, but what has he done for me lately? We kind of start thinking that way. And we don't know what to do. This is really kind of a nice pencil, so I'll give it back to you. There you go. Because I love you, Mabel. There you go. <laughs> the promises of God are there, over 7,000, but we, they're, alive, they're, they're alive within us, but we have to receive them. We, so if you're going to receive them, you have to know them. So if, if, if you're going to know them, you're going to have to go look for them. And you're going to have to get them in here. Do you wonder why life's difficult sometimes? And it's not about how many Bible verses you can memorize. If I can memorize 10 verses a week for the rest of my life, then I'll be okay with no problems, no worries. No, you're still going to have problems. I'll guarantee it. But when you hide his word in your heart, it equips you so that you don't fall into the temptations and the addictions that the world tries to get you to take a shortcut in. You fall back on his word and you rely upon him. Each person is filled with the promises of God. And it says that he has given us the magnificent promises so that by them we may become partakers with Christ. His goal is that we become partakers with him. But we have to know what this key is. And here's the key. It's not, there's no bullet to fill out or anything like that. Just write down the word character. That's the key. Character. If you want to experience the promises of God, you must develop character within your life. Now, I didn't say be a character, okay? I had that one down. Just ask my parents. They were like, that kid's a real character, you know? And that's, that was a nice way of saying he's nuts, okay? He's crazy. He needs uh, less sugar, you know? I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about developing character within your life, uh, integrity within your life, punctuality within your life, uh, a sense that when you say something, you will do something with what you said, you will back your word. There's a character quality that's developed within your life because when that character quality becomes developed, God's promises happen. You don't have to look for them, search for them, pay for them, work. I said that one already. Uh, you have to do any of that. You experience them because you developed his character in your life. Many of us are searching for God's promises only to point it out and say, hey, you said, when are you going to do this? And God does fulfill his promise. He does fulfill his word. But what he's looking for us is just like I extended that pencil, he's looking for us to reach out and take it. it take, take him by the hand. We, you and I, are filled with God's promises. I am filled with God's promises. Say it with me. I am filled with God's promises. You gotta, your ears got to hear yourself say that. The key is character. When I worked in Dallas at a hotel, uh, it was a Radisson Hotel, they were teaching. Now, when you go to hotels now, you swipe with a card, right? You know, are you in and out, just like the ATMs. But back in the day, uh, we still had cards, but they were like, there's holes punched in the card. You know what I mean? They would change the, the, the sequence of the pattern in order to match up with the lock. You probably don't know what I'm talking about. Anyway, it was old, okay? And they were teaching me on the job how to do this, because I had never seen it before myself. 
They're like, here's what you need to do. You can punch these cards and you can program it this way. And, and here's the tool that'll make the door do this and this and that. And show me. I'm like, wow, this is all new. And they, they were in the midst of training me, left me there that night to take care of the hotel all by myself. And I got a call. Maintenance, come up to such and such a room because the door's locked and we can't get it open. <laughs> no problem. You know, they just taught me all this. So I walk on up there with all my snazzy tools and, and all these cool little computer looking things and these hole punching quality tools, you know, to, to do my magic. And I worked on it and I couldn't get it. And so then I went to the next thing I had, which was like a screwdriver, where I, I resorted to kind of prying a little bit. And, and then I found this hammer down there that I thought, this will work. I'm getting more caveman as I go, right? Boom, 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 boom. I'm trying to get the door open. I eventually bend the lock. Uh, now, I've not got it necessarily unlocked, but I have some of the wood eaten away <laughs> at the door. You know, I'm basically breaking and entering at this point. And I finally get it open, only to get it halfway where it has that security flap. Oh, for the love of Pete, come on, you got to be kidding me. But I have bolt cutters. So if you visited our hotel, you would have seen me breaking into a room with big, you know, I probably looked like I belonged on Life PD or something. You know, I'm snapping the lock on this thing. I'm breaking into the door. I don't know to this day how that door got locked like that. None of us do. We were baffled by it. How did that door get locked like that? There's no adjoining room. There was nobody in the room, but it got locked. I went downstairs, felt like, whew, that was tough. The next day, I talked to my boss, and I said, he said what happened to that room? And I said, well, the door got locked. Well, didn't... Didn't they teach you and train you how to do that? I said, well, they did, but nothing worked. He said, well, why didn't you use the key? <laughs> what key? Well, the master key that we all know about, the glorified key that opens every door in this building. It's hanging right over there. Did nobody show you? Nobody showed me. There was a key in the maintenance room that hung there, swinging around like, look at me. I can open any door. All you have to do is grab me. And I never knew about it. They, they told me everything about how to program these keys and these locks, but they didn't tell me that when all else fails, here's the key. I could have just walked up there. Here's what happened. It took a lot of time. It took a lot of effort. And it cost a lot of money to fix the lock and the door that I now broke. Kind of. Sort of. It wasn't the most glorious moment in starting a job. But they said, here's the key. You know, I would propose to you that many of us are trying to get to the promises of God and we're approaching it as if it were a locked door. Beating on it, hitting it, trying with all of our fancy social media and image and let's look good and do we have the right colors and is there a puff of smoke and did we sing loud enough and, and did we follow chorus verse, chorus verse. And we're trying to get it all down as if it's a routine that's going to impress God when God said the whole time, the door, the door to my promises are never locked, they're always open. But what's the key that lets us in? Character. When you want, if you want to experience, if you're here today and you want to experience the promises of God, Develop your character. I'll talk about that in just a moment, how we do that. We develop our character as we go on in life. God has given us this key so that we can open these doors. Now, we have to understand this. Uh, I, I, I don't have a whole lot of time to talk about this guy, but his name's Henry Holland. Uh, he was one of my teachers, one of Lisa and I's teachers. And um, he, we became the assistant to the dean of families. Doesn't that sound nice and stuffy? Like, we're the assistant to the dean of families. And we thought, this is pretty cool. I like that rolls off the tongue. Had no idea what it meant. But, you know, it was almost like I have arrived. And you know what I found out when I arrived in this position? I didn't know anything. That's what I found out. I found out I, I, don't, I, I got a lot to learn. And I had Henry Holland, a guy who loves the Lord and loves it. This guy loves people. Like, he's kind of like a big, giant, saved version of Herman Munster. Okay? I mean, without the flat head and the green makeup and all that. I'm talking about that heart, that laughter. He's very jovial. And he said... Jim, he said, uh, the next day I was supposed to, to present and speak in front of all the leaders for a family and that. I didn't know it. And he says, are you ready? And I said, ready for what? And he says, you're supposed to teach this. And I said, I didn't know that. And he said, Jim, take a walk with me. <laughs> and we walked and we talked. And his conversation was one that said, Jim, you got, you got a great heart, but you need to develop some character, some things you need to learn. And he said it in a very loving way. I went to his office and I visited with him and I sat down feeling like I walked into the president's office and, you know, I was, I was all kind of intimidated, but yet I, I loved, 
you know, hanging around this guy. And he talked to me about what it is that needs to be developed in the heart because it has nothing to do with trying to impress God. It has to do with developing character in your life even when you're not at your best. He says, as a matter of fact, it's when you're at your worst and you can still respond out of character that honors Jesus Christ that you'll discover more promises that God has for you. I listened to this man as he poured into my life. I thank him for, for the time that he took, but I was like, what is this guy trying to teach me? Write down in the bullet in your outline this. He started to teach me this. God's promises are fulfilled only when God's character is developed. God's promises are fulfilled in your life only when you see God's character being developed. God has made a promise. I promise that I'm going to take care of my kids. But if my kids are going to act squirrely in the head, there's going to be a few limitations until I can figure out what's going on. You know what I'm talking about? Because you don't want to equip somebody with something that can harm them because you love them. God says, I've got promises for you, but if you're going to go squirrely on me, we're going to have to talk a little bit. And as you develop character, I'll be able to release my promises. As a matter of fact, it won't even be about releasing the promises. When you develop character, you're just going to be running smack dab into it, one promise after another, because you're honoring God with your life. So again, if you're here today and you said, that's what I want. I want, I want, I want those promises in a life that, that honors God. Well, Good, because I do too. But the question is, how do we get there? You know, it's going to take some work. God's promises are there. He, he gives those to us. But I think of in your, in, in your outline, I think I quoted it there, 1 Samuel chapter 2 and then 1 Samuel chapter 3. It, God's promises can fill your life, but they, they will remain unfulfilled in your life, in your marriage, in your future, and that if you don't develop godly character. Uh, Eli was, was the priest, and he took care of the sanctuary. He was, you know had everything going on. But, but it says this in, in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 3. But the sons of Eli were worthless men. This is the preacher's kids, okay? And this is a preacher kid telling you. So you can grow up in the house of God and miss his promises. You can be sitting here today and have enjoyed everything, <clears throat> excuse me, everything so far, but if you leave here and don't build that character in your life, you'll miss his promise. Eli's sons were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. Next chapter, there's a, uh, a man by the name of Samuel. He was kind of adopted into the family of, uh, of Eli, let's put it that way. And uh, He grew up and got to know some things. And he says, now Samuel did not know the Lord yet, nor had the word of the Lord been revealed to him. But he started to understand, <coughs> excuse me, the voice of the Lord. He started to understand that there needed to be a transformation that took place. If you get information in your head, that's great. That's where it starts. But, but if you let it stop right there, that's just kind of Pharisaic. You know, I know it all. You can read your Bible 12 hours a day, 24 hours a day, uh, seven, eight days a week, okay? And that is not going to impress God. Godly character does, though. And if you just let information be the only thing that you have, there's a limit to that. But if you let it sink down, and, and you know when you get excited and, and you start to get the holy goose pimples and you're like, whoo, I, I can sense the Holy Spirit. That's good. I'm not making fun of that. I love that too. But it doesn't always happen. So when it does not happen, does it mean that God is not present? If you don't feel it, does it mean that He's not there? No. So, it's good to have the information and it's good to get inspired, but where's the bread and the butter? It's in transformation. It's when you learn it, you get into the Word, it processes through here, inspires you, and leaks out into your hands and your feet so that when you hear about a group of people that are handing out donuts at a high school, you go, whew, what are they doing? Well, they're just loving God's kids in a practical way. And you say, that's pretty cool. Sorry. That's pretty cool. I want to get involved in that, and it inspires me, and then it transforms you and gets your feet and your hands walking. So you go down to Clinton High, Comanche High, Clinton Middle School, and you start using what God gave you to show God's love in a practical way. See, that's the goal, and that's how you see godly character developed. That's how you see it developed in your life. The New Testament's replete with encouragement to build character in our life. As a matter of fact, there's a quote there by Albert Einstein. I love this, because they asked him this uh, about um, uh, character. He, Albert Einstein said, people think that it's intellect that makes you a great scientist. They're wrong. It's character. This is Albert Einstein talking. A direct quote. He said, I'm not so smart. Now, he was smart. He was like uber smart. We all know that. But he said, that's not really what people notice about me. It's the character. And so that's true with God's people. 
He says that we have to understand uh, Barbara Walters, when she was doing her shows, you know, and she would come and address on national TV, she once said, and I'm going way back, but she said, there's a, there's a crisis in America today. And I believe that crisis is still there. Um, and it doesn't seem like, she said, anyone even notices it anymore. And this crisis is not about education. This crisis is not about technology. This crisis is not about finances. In America, we have a crisis of character. We have a crisis of character. We're putting people in leadership positions that have talent, but no character. We're putting people that are leading out of Hollywood, that have reputations and they have talent, but they have no character. We're graduating students from high school and college. They know trigonometry, biology, physics, history, science, but they don't have the character to resolve simple problems in their family and in their life. So why in America are we so shy of character? There's a little bullet there right down. One of the reasons is, and I talked about it briefly, it's because building godly character takes hard work. It takes hard work. I'm going to read two verses. Why don't you uh, read them with me? There's Ecclesiastes and this 1 Timothy. Let's go with Ecclesiastes first. Ready? Go. For the dream comes about by much effort. Do you like that word effort? Well, you don't mind it if it's somebody else. The effort. 1 Timothy, let's read that together. Ready? Go. Discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. Effort, discipline, that, 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 that is telling us it's going to take some work. The Bible's been very clear. The promises of God are true, and not one of his words will return void that he has spoken, but he's also said, it's going to take a little work on your part, on my part. We have to discipline ourselves. Why is life so tough? Well, first of all, just because it's life. It's a sin nature. It's a sin world. That's why God came and died so we can be with him. But until that day comes, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness so that you never lose sight. You're a spiritual being, not a human being. One day when you die, you will end up in an eternity. The question is, which way will you go? And you, you will decide by your ability to place your faith in God, build character, or not. Or not. That other little bullet, um, write this down. Talent can take you where character will not sustain you. I got to tell you, I had, I had somebody come up for a service and said, did you say that backwards? Well, maybe I didn't word it the greatest, so let me explain what I meant by it. Talent is a good thing. You know, there's a lot of talented people here. I'm looking across the room, and there's some people that I would say, you're very talented, that you would not say you are. You're like, no, not me. I'm not talented. Yes, you are. As a matter of fact, every one of us are. It's just, what is your talent? Just because you're uh, on stage or the loudest or the shiniest, uh, sometimes that tends to get the most attention, but we all have talent. But I'm going to tell you right now, talent is limited. We seem to think in our world today that talent is the one thing to pursue because it's going to be the one thing that will get us to where we will go, I have arrived. But you'll never be satisfied. It'll never be enough. Why? Because you did not build character along the way. Can you have talent and character? Sure. But it's going to take hard work. You're going to have to discipline yourself. And that's usually where we go, oh, that seems like a lot of work. And that's why we stay where we're at. It will take some work, but it's not like it's not doable. You have to build character along the way. There's many very talented people that began well, only to end poorly. Why? Because of character. Now, I'm going to skip over Genesis. It's the verse about Abraham there, and it's just talking about the fact that God says that he wants to reveal to Abraham the promises that he has fulfilled in his life. Um, but number two, I want you to write this down. When we're talking about God's promises that are yet to come, know this. Godly character is first modeled, then developed. It's first modeled and then developed. Research and polls have shown that the greatest influence on a child, good or bad, is his or her parents. I've always said children are like video recorders with legs because they walk around and watch everything and they watch. And you can tell them, don't do this. You know, do as I say, not as I do. That never works, by the way. You know, it, that's, that's more a joke now than anything else. You might as well say, everything I'm doing, yeah, you're probably going to end up doing it. it Why? Because they're watching you. 
So why, why shouldn't that drive you to want to build a greater character in your life? Because somebody's watching. Kids are watching you, the good and the bad. So if you do something goofy and then you try to cover it up with, well, you know, you, you shouldn't do that, and, but yet you keep doing it, what do you think that child is going to do? Are they going to listen to what you say or are they going to listen to what you do? Well, statistics show they listen to what you do. You can talk all day long, all day long, and they're not going to, they, they, they don't care. Not that they don't care about you, but if you say black, but you do white, no matter how much you say black, they're going to watch you, the choices you make. They're going to watch that. So it is with character that we've got to find, because character, godly character, is something that's modeled. The greatest model we have is the Word of God. It's through Jesus Christ, His Son. You, you, you can find that in the Scriptures through the fruit of the Spirit. When, when the pressures of life come on, what comes out of you? Is it godly character or is it a bunch of stuff that you might be ashamed of? Things that you say, I'm not too proud of. You know, we all want it to be that when the pressures of the world squeeze us, we got, you know, the delicious fruity flavor of the Holy Spirit coming out of us. But sometimes that's not always the case. Why? Because we're, we're always working on that. But as you develop that godly character, he reveals his promises to you and to me. He, said, he tells us in um, uh, 2 Kings there, I put down, while these nations feared the Lord, they also served their idols, their children likewise, and their grandchildren, as their fathers did, so they did till this day. So we tell our kids, do as I say, not as I do. While all the time our children are going to do what it is they see. And it's been no different since the days of the Bible. So what are we supposed to do? Build godly character. You've got to find somebody. That, I mean, maybe you're in a, in a place where you're like, Pastor, I'm 45, 55, 65, and, and I don't have anybody that's modeling it for me. Well, first of all, get into the Word of God. Secondly, start looking for that person in your life that models good character and use them as a pace setter in your life. You, start, you don't even have to tell them that they're your, they're your pace setter. You just say, there's somebody who loves the Lord and loves others. There's somebody who's integrous. There's somebody who's punctual. There's somebody who, who's honoring. honoring. There's, there, there's a worshiper, and I'm going to follow. I'm going to watch them, and I'm going to set my pace to them so that I can have that character develop in my life till the time comes where I start learning what it means to, to do that on my own. And you start experiencing those promises of God. But you and I must, we must, number three, write down, God's promises must be pursued with great intentionality. Great intentionality. If you sit back and hope God's going to run into you, if you sit back and hope he's going to run you over, most likely it's not going to happen. I ride with the deputies for the sheriff's office, and I enjoy doing that. Um, it's just, number one, it's fun. Uh, when they get that pedal to the metal, ooh, half my brain's going, we're going to die. And the other half's going, woohoo! You know, I'm like having a blast. But I, I was riding with one of them one day, and, and all of a sudden we're talking, and we're talking about, you know, nothing. Hey, how the corn grows in Iowa. You know, it's boring. We're just, I can ride with them for a whole shift for eight hours and not have one call. And they'll be like, I'm sorry, dude, we didn't have any bad guys to catch today. I'm like, that's all right. I wasn't out here for them. I was out here for you. You know, we just had a good time. I try to buy them lunch. We, we kind of compete with one another now when I do ride. I haven't ridden for a while. I'll try to buy them lunch, and then they're like, no, 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 I'm going to buy you lunch. And eventually they pull the trump card. I've got the gun. Okay, you can buy lunch. <laughs> and, uh, but I was riding with one of them one day, and we were just talking and ho-hum and, you know, yeah, life's good. And all of a sudden, something came across the radio. I don't know what it said. I don't know what was going on. But their head kind of went, and they got the Terminator mode. And I was still having a good time. <laughs> Being all goofy over here, and I'm like, hello, you Okay. Oh, lights go on. I'm like, uh-oh. Something's going on. I don't know what's going on, but I know now. He, he doesn't, he's not even aware that I'm in the seat, okay? Because that's what they got to do. And we're flying down the road. So again, you know, oh my God, we're going to die. Yes, this is fun. And I'm having a great time. And they, and long story short, they were after somebody who hurt somebody else, and uh, they were pursuing them with great intentionality. They were after them. And when they saw them, they locked on to them. And they just kept going. Where they went, the car went. Every turn they made, they made a turn. Every time they sped up, they sped up. When they slowed down, they slowed down. They did not let them go like a pit bull on the hiney of somebody. They got a hold of them, and they would not let go until that, can I say hiney in church? Is that all right? Okay. They would not let go until that person stopped. 
pulled over, slowed down, and they caught who they were after. So it is with the promises of God. Do you pursue God with that great of an intentionality? Some of us are going, we're sitting at home. We got the Cheetos on our chest with the remote in our hand going, oh, God's good God all the time. And that's true, but He's not going to run you over on your couch, most likely, with His blessings. He wants you to pursue Him. That's why we worship. That's why we gather together. That's why we ask Him and seek that encouragement in our hearts. Seek God's promises and pursue them with great intentionality. And do not let go. Go after Him and say, God, I know you have over 7,000 promises in this thing. There's got to be at least one of them in there for me, if not more. Reveal them to, uh, reveal them to me. Show them to me. But here's the trick. You're not going to know it unless you open it up and start getting into it. I got scribbles everywhere. Does that make me very spiritual? No, because you can't really read any of them anyway. But I tell you what, I scribble in here because I need to know. Why do I need to know? Because I forget that God promised me and said that you have the victory and you're, anything that I face greater is he that's within me than anything else in this world. A scripture that we quote a lot. But when it becomes a promise that he's revealed to you, it's a key and it unlocks a door because it builds character in your life and his promises they then become released. Character is like if you're here today and you're married and your wife has on a ring and it's a diamond ring, there's prongs that hold on to that diamond, right? Uh, or at least there should be. If you're missing a prong, if that prong is loose, you jeopardize losing that precious stone, right? Character is like those prongs. It's the thing that holds on and develops and braces the most precious thing, which is the promises of God. If you don't have strong character, you can miss out on the most valuable thing that God has for your life. So develop character. And watch how as you honor God with your life, God will honor you. Father, I thank you for your word, and I pray today that you would just in our hearts and lives, or we, we love, we love experiencing your presence. Sometimes we can get a little nervous. And sometimes it might look a little messy. But Lord, we're declaring today we're, we're good with that as long as we have you. So Father, I pray today that you would just reveal your promises to us and through us this week. Maybe this week as you're going, you'll have to do like we did this morning when we just take a position and we kneel down and we stop in the midst of our day and say, God, I want to honor you with my life. Teach me what it means to build character. Show me where I'm weak so that you can make me strong. And as we honor the Lord, when we stand back up, we'll be able to stand with a new strength. I just want to ask this. In a moment, if this is you, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. Don't do it yet. But if you're here today and you've been struggling with the promises of God, and maybe today you're realizing maybe it's because I've not been pursuing them with great intentionality. I've not been going after God. I've been sitting back with Cheetos on my chest waiting for God to just show up and do the work for me. Uh, maybe you're here today and you realize that, that because of the work you may be backed off, but today God's stirring your heart once again. His promises, they do not return void. He has a plan and a purpose, but we must do our part. He's extending to us that gift, but we must reach out and receive it. Are you here today and you've been struggling with that and you need encouragement in your your heart and you need to make a decision that says yes I will pursue him with greater intentionality if that's you simply raise your hand and say God that's me God you see their hands you see their hearts these are people that are saying that's me that's me that's me I'm humbling my heart and I'm choosing today to say Lord I pursue you so father I pray a blessing upon each and every person here that as they raise their hand the world has a way of beating us down the world has a way of, of dragging us through the mud but you have a way of making beauty out of ashes. So Father, I pray today that we will, as we honor you, you will be glorified in all that we do. We ask in your name. Amen.